Yes. Good morning. My name is Bob Bailey. I'm the president of the board of the Alaka Alliance, and I want to welcome you to our second presentation for a 2023 science symposium. Uh, this talk is on remotely operated vehicles, commonly known as ROVs, and artificial intelligent methods, or AI, methods of image analysis and methods of conducting benthic surveys within bull kelp beds. Uh, research has shown over and over that sea otters affect ecological function in coastal ecosystems. Monitoring and quantifying these functions is challenging because of our limited ability to safely and repeatedly survey these benthic communities and their structure. Remotely operated vehicles, or ROVs, have the potential to overcome this limitation and expand the area which we uh, can collect in. As an, emergent, as an emerging technology, ROVs have yet to be systematically integrated into long-term kelp forest monitoring programs. As part of new research by the Seattle Aquarium, the AA Seattle Aquarium, uh, an R ROV has been adapted to conduct video surveys within kelp forests mm -hmm. along the Olympic coast. Zach Randell is a research scientist at Seattle Aquarium. He received his PhD in integrative biology from Oregon State University, broadly studying kelp forest ecology, where he worked on analyzing long-term subtitle monitoring data and conducting subtitle experiments using SCUBA. Zach will give us the lowdown on his work to develop methods to utilize relatively low-cost ROV hardware, as well as open space uh, open source ROV software and analyses that could be employed in other monitoring programs. So Zach, it's all yours and I'm all ears. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you, Bob. Chanel, you should be seeing a title slide if everything is working properly and you should also be able to uh, hear and see me. Can I get a, a thumbs up or confirmation? Indeed. All right, excellent. Well, thank you very much. Um, well, hello everyone. My name is Zachary Randell. I'm a research scientist at the Seattle Aquarium, and I'm very excited to talk to you today about using uh, remotely operated vehicles and AI methods of image analysis to conduct kelp forest video surveys. Um, I wanna give a shout out to my co-authors, uh, Megan Williams and Elena Bogdanova, both research technicians on my team. Uh, Megan's been with us since August of last year and Elena just joined us a couple weeks ago. Um, Sean Larson, Dr. Sean Larson, uh, many of you may know from the Seattle Aquarium, she's my supervisor and she helped get this work up and running. And I also wanna give a shout out to Clyde McQueen. Uh, he's a Seattle Aquarium uh, volunteer and he's a retired software developer and he has single-handedly been um, advancing our work uh, with some software that I will get into. Um, so with that, uh, thank you very much for having me here and let's dig into this. So I'm, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this slide. I think this audience likely has a good sense of the motivation for studying kelp forests. They facilitate robust ecological functioning, um, not only at the site of growth, but at adjacent ecosystems. They provide food and shelter to numerous species, and they especially provide habitat at critical life stages. Um, rockfish, for example, as well as salmon are two examples. Uh, the food web connectivity enabled by kelp forests reaches far and wide and even affects the uh, orca population up here in Washington. And then these kelp forests, these ecosystems have deep cultural significance. And, and these are slides that I've used in a previous talk and the Alaka Alliance is front and center here um, as that uh, significance component. So uh, the mission of bringing sea otters back to Oregon one day, not just uh, to bring sea otters back themselves, but also to help increase the ecological functioning of kelp forests and all the second, third, fourth order effects that kelp forests have on the surrounding community. So they're important ecosystems. And, and again, I don't need to spend too much time here, but after 2013, 2014, 2015, we are learning more and more that these are uh, imperiled ecosystems. Um, the warm water events over those years uh, really had an impact. We saw that particularly in um, Oregon and Northern California and Washington as well, though it happened at other locations large-scale declines in canopy coverage. The green is kelp, this is um, satellite imagery, and you can see the uh, drastic declines at locations across Northern California. Um, Pycnopodia declined, I'm very much looking forward to the talk 
um, after mine from Aaron, uh, learning more about those and the status of their species. And then we saw the rise in sea urchins and the crash of abalone all, all in Northern California. So this, this ecosystem kelp forest, they are facing challenges. And I think it was a big eye opener for, for the research and conservation and restoration community. So in terms of my motivation, um, I am very excited at the prospect of uh, increasing our capacity to gather information. All of our actions, conservation management, restoration policy, everything in the near shore coastal space, it comes down to, to data-driven decisions, information-driven decisions. Do we vacuum up urchins with dredge pumps? Do we smash them? How many fish do we gather? Of what size class? Of what sex? Where do we outplant critically endangered pinto abalone? Uh, how do we go about kelp aquaculture? How do we go about kelp restoration? All of this requires information. My core motivation is to help contribute to increasing our ability to gather information along the seafloor in these shallow ecosystems. To give you a quick sense of my background, um, I come at this as a field biologist. I grew up in Anchorage, Alaska. I started scuba diving up there. I went to UC Santa Cruz to prefer, uh, per, pursue scientific diving. Um, I quickly was trained up on benthic surveys, so laying out a meter tape underwater and collecting data on a underwater clipboard such as this. Oh, it's going to blur it out, but uh, we, we manually collect this data with pencils and, and plasticized paper underwater. Um, in the course of my PhD with Dr. Mark Novak at Oregon State University in the Department of Integrative Biology, um, I dug into San Nicolas Island, uh, located 80 kilometers offshore of Southern California. Uh, as noted in the previous talk, there was a sea otter translocation out there um, in the late 80s. Um, I dug into a 40-year subtitle monitoring program, an absolutely incredible time series where USGS biologists have gone down twice a year, every year, uh, to gather information from fixed transects. So those are fixed locations. You can see the little tick marks here on the bathymetry maps. So there's bolts in the seafloor and the divers go down and collect the information from those exact spots. And we're able to gain some uh, powerful inference from, from those data. So we have locations that flip back and forth between two alternative stable states, a state of urchin barrens depicted here, and then a state of um, forested state uh, where the kelp forest is thriving. So we had that, and then we had locations nearby that exhibited 40 years of kelp forest persistence. So um, uninterrupted kelp forests, no urchin barrens, no nothing. So I'm not gonna dig into the mechanism or, or what we found there with that. Um, what I wanna note, however, is that our inference was, was very limited to these exact little transects. When thinking about island-wide uh, island scales of inference, um, it, it's hard to speak to that. When we have seven sites with relatively small transects, we, we only have so much information about the life along the seafloor. As you can see here, these, these are small slivers of a vast sea. And so this really got me thinking more and more in the latter parts of my PhD about what would it look like to increase the area across which we could gather data. How could we go about that? What, what are our possible options? And that led us to remotely operated vehicles. That led us to ROVs. Uh, in the last year of my PhD, I worked with uh, Sean Larson to write many uh, proposals to try to bring in funding to get a position created. Uh, we were eventually successful and, and we've been uh, growing the team um, from there. But so ROVs. What, what can they potentially do for us? So you have likely heard of ROVs. They are large, expensive, complicated pieces of engineering. They've historically been deployed in uh, deep offshore locations, off large seafaring vessels. They have not typically been used within kelp forests. They have not typically been used to, to gather long-term data in the way that scientific scuba divers do. But things are changing. And uh, the technology is advancing, and there are now companies out there producing relatively inexpensive models, um, modular technology, open source software, and companies that are trying to enable 
folks such as natural resource managers and researchers and those involved in conservation to be able to actually get out and use this technology. Um, so the company, the ROV that we have, Blue Robotics is getting some, some free PR here. Um, we use the Blue Robotics technology. Um, they have a fantastic forums where we can troubleshoot um, with a broad community that is using this technology. There's also other companies out there that sell sensors. Uh, Waterlinked is one such company. We use their underwater GPS as well as their DVL, a Doppler velocity log um, that enables precise tracking of the spatial positioning of the ROV. And we were just last week in LA at a Blue Robotics conference, um, Elena Clyde and I, and we were able to meet the Blue Robotics team and start a dialogue with them, as well as um, a team from Waterlinked. So they're a great group to work with, and um, we're excited to be using their technology. So what are we doing? Um, I'm in the Department of uh, Conservation Programs and Partnerships. I'm a research scientist in there. Um, you likely have heard of Dr. Sean Larson. She's been leading long-term research programs there for decades now. She's been doing um, sea otter foraging and distribution surveys out on the Olympic coast. She's also been leading rockfish surveys via scuba diving offshore Nia Bay, as well as uh, throughout multiple locations within Puget Sound. Um, Dr. Aaron Meyer uh, was our former uh, vice president and is now the chief conservation officer at the Seattle Aquarium. So she was recently promoted into this exciting new position. Um, so we'll be shortly looking for a new VP to um, lead conservation programs and partnerships. Uh, but CPP has been growing quite a bit recently. Um, this is the team as it currently stands, and I wanted to include Elena as she wasn't present uh, a couple months ago when, when we had this group outing, um, but we're growing and we now have a program in place using these ROVs to go out and conduct kelp forest surveys. So I want to touch briefly on some of our motivation, and a lot of it, at least on the outer coast, comes down to that question of sea otters and ecological resilience. Can sea otters increase the resilience of an ecosystem, particularly following anomalous warm water events. Uh, you may have seen this paper by Rasher et al. from the Aleutian Archipelago. They found that uh, changes in water temperature increase the rate at which urchins graze these clathromorphum beds. Uh, and then a uh, concurrent change in pH weakens the calcareous structure of those beds. So those two climate-related events resulted in widespread devastation of the clathromorphum beds. And the authors argued, had sea otters been present, they may have been able to mitigate some of that. So it's an interesting hypothesis, and it's something we want to follow up on. Uh, if that is happening or something similar is happening along the Washington coast, it would be via very different mechanisms. Um, but what we did see when kelp declined um, widely along the Pacific Northeast in 2013, 14, and 15 is that kelp declined uh, along the Washington coast like it did elsewhere, but it bounced back really quick. Um, and the areas that it bounced back along roughly align with areas where sea otters are present. So it's, there, there's a lot of data we still need to gather there to test that in a robust manner but that is one of our core motivations. Um, if, if it is true or even partially true that sea otters contribute to ecological resilience along the outer Washington coast, that could be really useful information uh, to you all in Oregon and to elsewhere for sea otter conservation. I'll just quickly note too, that we have run the ROV at uh, multiple lo locations offshore of Nia Bay and out along the outer coast. Uh, and it, it is a absolutely stunning subtitle uh, community. It, it's very patchy, very spatially patchy. You have areas with robust understory algae and invertebrate diversity, and then you have adjacent locations of high urchin density and low kelp density. And, and what we're now starting to get a sense of after a recent trip is that there really is a continuum, a spectrum of what these urchin-dominated regions look like. In some cases, similar to what you see here, there are many other invertebrate species present. So you can see some um, cup corals or some crusting coral and algae. And then what we recently saw, I think two, two, three weeks ago when we were last out there with macaw fisheries management, there's other locations offshore of Nia Bay that are absolutely devoid of any other invertebrate life other than sea urchins. They've been completely scoured. It's hard substrate. I don't know what else would do that other than sea urchin. Um, omnivory when they are in their ravenous mode, 
Um, but so it, we're, we're very much looking forward to digging in there more. And that's where we want to go with this work. So I'm going to give you a quick overview of some projects that we have underway. Uh, the work along the outer coast that I just mentioned is one of them. We've received some grants to um, expand or start some partnerships with uh, some groups out there. So we've worked with uh, Macaw Fisheries Management, um, Quill Ute Natural Resources, uh, Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary, and we've done multiple um, ROV events and flights out there. They've largely been proof of concept events. We do not yet have a um, uh, standardized long-term monitoring program on the outer coast yet. We're still working out um, vessel access. It's, it's a tricky remote spot to work. Um, but you can see here, we've done some really fun outreach events. We, the Macaw Fisheries Management crew took us out on their vessel along with the Macaw interns. And we were able to fly the ROV in a kelp forest and an urchin barren. And, and really show them what, what's in their own waters um, via the ROV, which you can see via the laptop. And then we've also done some events with the schools. For example, we flew the ROV on a, a sunken vessel in the Macaw Marina for a Schools Without Walls outreach event, which was really fun. Okay, uh, so the first group that actually funded us and, and shout out to the Port of Seattle, um, with their support, we were able to get a position for me created this was back in um, 2021 that, that we were thinking about this. So the aquarium was still very much in COVID times. So the port kind of kind of saved us there. Uh, we have a long-term program in place with the port. We have a network of eight sites that we've set up to survey with the ROV, four transects each. Um, these are throughout Elliott Bay. That's, uh, that's in the Seattle area. Um, the port is really interested in um, the persistence of bull kelp. They see bull kelp growing in very trafficked, um, vehicle heavy, you know, lots of container ships and ferries and small boats coming in and out. Um, and bull kelp is thriving in some locations and not so much in other locations. And bull kelp restoration has worked in some part, parts and failed to thrive in other parts. So the port is really wanting us to dig into the, the substrate type, the species that associate with these persistent bull kelp forests in order to perhaps help guide bull kelp restoration in the future. And we were just uh, funded relatively recently by HSIL. So with money from the EPA distributed to uh, WDNR, Department of Natural Resources, as well as Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, through this group, HSIL, Habitat Strategic Initiatives Lead. Um, so they're going to be funding us to do um, several, several new aspects of work. So we will be flying the ROV with Puget Sound Restoration Fund um, on their outplanted bull kelp restoration locations to do site-wide surveys before, during, after, as well as use the ROV to monitor the bull kelp to see how this new technology can perhaps aid bull kelp restoration efforts. Um, we're also going to be doing a tight one-to-one -one methods comparison. So I mentioned the benthic surveys, divers going down and, and collecting data. We're going to use reef checks protocols, uh, reef check divers to go down, lay down the meter tape, and then the ROV is going to fly over that meter tape and gather the video imagery. And then the divers will go down and on the same meter tape collect their data. So what we're developing is relatively new, um, especially relatively new to kelp for us. So we really want to try to drill down into the pros and cons of both data collection platforms in order to try to figure out how we want to utilize this data collection tool going forward. Um, as an example, a ROV may be able to cover more territory than a scuba diver can, but for the downward facing view, an ROV is not going to lift up the blade of an understory um, kelp individual to see the kelp crab underneath, whereas a reef check diver absolutely is sifting through the understory to find those cryptic invertebrates. And so those are the types of differences that we want to gather in a uh, rigorous manner. And we, we're going to do that at multiple locations in Elliott Bay, as well as the San Juan Islands. Um, and lastly, with the HSO project, we will be expanding upon a full kelp habitat suitability model. Um, Gray McKenna and others um, at Puget Sound uh, Restoration Fund, formerly at Puget Sound Restoration Fund, started this amazing open source bull kelp habitat suitability model. And we are going to be adding layers of ROV derived information to that in order to, again, help guide the efficacy of uh, bull kelp restoration efforts. Okay, so kind of drilling down a bit into the details of what these surveys consist of. 
We operate broadly off of small vessels. Um, the ROV surveys about 0.8 to 1 meters above the seafloor. It surveys relatively slowly uh, to gather smooth imagery. Um, we conduct approximately 50 to 100 meter transects that vary a bit depending on context and what we're encountering down there. We gather imagery facing forward, facing downward, 4K, 30 FPS. Um, we shoot in the native white balance format, which is uh, GoPros. Uh, it's similar to shooting raw. So we process the imagery afterwards to improve the, the color. Um, what I want to note, though, in Washington waters, this, this is challenging. So these are temperate waters. And uh, we experience algal blooms and dark murky water seasonally. So what we found is that uh, May, June, July, um, first part of August, you know, if you want to go out and collect data, there's really not much utility in putting the ROV in the water when it looks like that. Um, the latter part of August, September, October is when the algal blooms clear up, the water clears up and the, the annual vegetation such as bulk kelp and other species is still present. So that's, that's when we have a big survey push. And we actually just yesterday uh, finished our surveys for the port of Seattle for that urban kelp project. So we're very excited to have finished that all up. Um, and I also wanna note a, a non-trivial entanglement risk. I'm sure those of you have, who have dove in kelp forests or are familiar with them are going, how are you running a vehicle with a tether in kelp? Um, and it's absolutely a challenge, though we have figured out some methods. I found, unfortunately, that um, video doesn't seem to do super well when we stream it via screen sharing. So I can't show you this super cool video of us um, prying open a tangle of bulk help stipes in order to fly the ROV through a gap. Um, you'll just have to take my word for it, or it's, it's posted publicly on our GitHub website, which I'll link to later. Um, we have found methods of working through bulk help. Uh, in short, we drive the ROV straight. We don't do a lot of turns. We don't do a lot of fancy business. We do a single survey into the kelp bed. When we reach the end, we turn the ROV around, pan the built-in camera up. We locate the tether, which is buoyant. And then we follow that tether very carefully out of the bed. Um, the tether basically provides our path back out. So we follow it like a breadcrumb crumb trail. Uh, we can also do some tricks that's illustrated with this video. So the tether operator on the vessel can put tension on the tether. And then what we do in this video is motor laterally to the right and it peels open this, uh, an opening in these stipes that we were then able to fly the ROV through. One big caveat, uh, we have not actually tested this in Macrocystis, uh, giant kelp. There's a lot more uh, vegetation. The blades of giant kelp um, extend all throughout the, the water column. So that very well could provide additional challenges to the ROV. Um, I think it's gonna vary depending on context, the degree to which the ROV would be successful in macrocystis. Um, and to be perfectly honest, there's absolutely a density of bulk help at which the ROV is just not really gonna be able to, to maneuver through, even as small and, and as maneuverable as it is. Um, this, what I'm, what I'm proposing here and what we're working on here, it's not meant to be a replacement of scuba divers. It's meant to be an additional tool in our toolkit. Okay, so hardware, uh, what does this actually look like? So these are um, two ROVs or we have two ROVs. These are two different angles. Um, I'm just gonna move the little window with the videos out, okay. Uh, so these, this is a customized ROV from Blue Robotics. Uh, we've added some HDPE paneling here to provide some kelp guards that prevent, prevent kelp from getting caught up in the lights, our light mounts here. These lights are pretty key to provide uh, illumination of the seafloor. So the downward facing camera, which you can't really see here, can gather imagery. Um, we also have various sonars installed. So we have a water-linked underwater GPS system to track the positioning of the, of the uh, vehicle underwater. And then we have a DVL, a Doppler velocity log. It's a very sophisticated sensor, which provides super, super precise um, tracking of the displacement of the ROV across the seafloor. So if the acoustic GPS runs into any trouble, like an acoustic shadow or, or the boats wobbling around, um, the DVL can provide really precise tracks of precisely where the vehicle went. Um, so like I said, we're shooting video facing forward and downwards. We're using GoPro cameras right now, but we're actually in the process of evaluating what would it look like to upgrade those. 
That's something that Elena is digging into that we're excited about. Uh, the system's pretty portable. Uh, so we have everything we need basically packaged into this Pelican case. Um, it's already pre-hooked up. So all we need to really do is plug in the tether into this little connector right there and pop a battery into the ROV. This is the battery enclosure down here, and then we're good to go. This thing right here, this is a satellite compass. I'll come back to that briefly. Basically, that provides an external measurement of uh, the, the vessel's GPS and compass heading, which is necessary information for the acoustic tracking system. Okay, now this is the part of the talk where if we were in person, I would uh, play a video of what, the, what it looks like facing downward and facing forward. But again, because it's uh, streaming, I'm not, I'm not gonna do that. Instead, I'll, I'll just show a couple of recent clips. This was from Mia Bay uh, two weeks ago, I believe it was. And we got some really nice footage. What was interesting is we encountered uh, areas where lots of kelp was present, lots of juvenile kelp was present, but on unconsolidated sub substrate. So as you can see here, this is practically sand, small pebbles, but we had wide swaths of area where there was a huge amount of growth. And likewise, mixture of unconsolidated sandy substrate here with a bit of hard substrate. What we then found right, right next door was that as soon as that substrate uh, went from unconsolidated to hard, and you had those bedrock pinnacle structures, large boulders, it was, it was completely scoured of kelp. And it, it was essentially an urchin barren or, or a high urchin density location. So really interesting to see. And, and what we're finding more and more with the ROV is that it's a excellent tool to gather that broader snapshot of what is the spatio-temporal uh, variability of the system, specifically, especially spatial, to, to capture that patchiness. I think that's something where it's going to be very, very useful going forward. Okay, um, I'm going to briefly touch on what we're doing with the data. Um, we're in the process of training open source AI programs. So we are not uh, software developers. Uh, we are not computer engineers. Uh, so these we are utilizing programs that anyone can use. So Viame is a program that was uh, developed by Kitware with support from NOAA and other funding sources. It allows us to perform object detection. So you can basically put a box around a thing. So in this case, bull kelp stipes from the forward facing imagery and then inverts and fish from the downward facing imagery. And so this is how we're getting at basically abundance counts, similar to a scuba diver going down and writing, okay, one urchin, two urchin, et cetera. We are also using CoralNet. This is another open source program. It's been a while for a little bit, around for a little bit longer. Uh, and instead of doing object detection, we gather metrics of percent coverage. So this is for categories and taxa that are not what we call individually conspicuous. So for here with fleshy red algae, you can see you don't really, you can't really tell whether a single blade is at a single individual. It's just kind of a mass of something. So that's where percent coverage, these 100 randomly placed points, that really comes into, into play. Uh, we are also using percent coverage to capture the underlying substrate. So this is something I'm especially excited for, um, for the bull kelp habitat suitability modeling. That's gonna give us some really fine scale resolution into the underlying substrate that the vegetation is growing upon. And I should mention too, this is why we conduct ROV surveys in the summer, as in what we just finished up right now, but we also conduct winter surveys when the annual vegetation is absent and largely removed. That's when we can go back and get um, really detailed imagery of what the underlying substrate consists of. And you just can't get that information in the summer when the vegetation is, in some cases, completely obscuring the benthos. So with CoralNet, we can gather um, these percent cover information. Um, I'm really excited about CoralNet for multiple reasons, one of which is this is how we are going to increase the amount of data we're gathering by two orders of magnitude. So this is where scuba divers would go out and conduct uniform point contact surveys. I've done these surveys myself with Pisco. I, I love them, they're a lot of fun. You lay out a 30 meter tape and every meter mark along the tape, you put your finger down, what's under that? Is it sand, bedrock, red algae, brown algae, et cetera? So you have 
30, 30 meter marks essentially, or 30 data points per a 30 meter transect. With CoralNet, we extract a still image from the video every meter. So that's 30 still images with 100 data points per still image. That's 3000 data points for a 30 meter transect. So that's part of why I think this could change the way we gather information and data from the seafloor. Okay, and I alluded to this a little bit. This is just a quick screen grab from a photo. Um, how do we wanna use this data? One application, we want to train these um, habitat suitability models. So in short, they take all sorts of information about the underlying substrate and the species and the environmental variables present to produce a, in some cases, probability distribution in the Bayesian framework of the likelihood of encountering a um, bull kelp, for example, given the precise underlying configuration and species present. So that's where we wanna go with the work. We're not quite ready to develop those yet. We're still in the process of training these AI models, but that's where we're going. Okay, so am I doing on time, right? Not bad. Uh, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about probably the biggest challenge that we've encountered uh, developing this methodology. And that comes down to ROV positioning. And that is where is the vehicle precisely at all times? Uh, this is very important information because if we are gonna be developing habitat suitability models, those are spatially explicit. We need to know precisely where we are. Um, what I'm showing you here, these are transects from our uh, acoustic GPS system uh, from earlier this year, I believe. They're about 60 meters long. We flew the ROV straight, and that is not what the GPS recorded. So we've had some challenges with that and, and debugging that. However, um, with Clyde's help, he was able to write a Python script that harvested the acoustic information from the tracking system. So the acoustic GPS has the acoustics, which is underwater. There's a transmitter on the ROV and a receiver on the vessel that listens for that signal. And then on the vessel, we have a GPS system um, that tells you where in the world you are. So you have to integrate the acoustics with the top side surface vessel information. And what we're finding out from Clyde's script is that the acoustics is working really well. You can see this looks much more like the path of an ROV. Um, and what we were having was the, the top side G2 box. Um, there was just a bit more air in the top side GPS and compass than we'd like. And that air propagated um, when integrating the acoustic information and it gave us these kind of wonky tracks. So with Clyde's help, we uh, developed or integrated this uh, satellite compass. So this provides very, very, very smooth GPS tracking as well as a very smooth compass heading of the top side vessel. And then Clyde was able to write custom software to feed that information to the acoustic system. So now we're basically supplying the information that was providing the, the, um, the air. And so Clyde developed a blue OS extension. I know that probably won't mean anything to anyone, that's okay. Basically, it's a framework that Blue Robotics has developed such that anyone can develop custom software and package it to run automatically when we fly an ROV. So we're, we're running multiple uh, pieces of custom software and we don't have to run anything in the command line. We don't have to know anything about programming. We basically click a button and the software is engaged. So that's one example of how the open source model that Blue Robotics is pursuing can be really powerful uh, when you have someone like Clyde who can develop the software. Okay, and just staying here for a moment because these are very hard fought results. Um, you can see here the, the track of an ROV. This was actually offshore of Nia Bay two weeks ago. And you can see the acoustic information. There's a little bit of wiggle, but this actually does kind of look like the track of where uh, an ROV went. And then what this is, this is the Doppler velocity log track. So this is a downward facing sonar. It sends four beams downwards. They bounce back up and the, and the sensor detects uh, how the ROV is moving across the seafloor. These DVLs are highly, highly precise. And so this track can essentially be considered the truth of what actually happened with the vehicle. And so what we see here is that the acoustic tracking information and the DVL line up really, really well. And so this, this was a big win for us to, to have dialed in the spatial positioning issue so, so well. 
And what Clyde's working on right now is um, integrating these two pieces of information, the, the GPS as well as the DVL. And so the vehicle will be able to process both of those data streams as well as the IMU, the um, inertial movement unit, uh, accelerometers and other types of um, gyroscopes and sensors. So all of that will be integrated in real time on the vehicle to output a final point. And it's, it's a Bayesian model. And so it's again, that posterior probability distribution that says, okay, given the acoustic GPS, given the DVL, given the gyros on the ROV, we think the vehicle is here. Um, so this, this is the result of Clyde simulations working on this uh, using the data we gathered from the field. And so we are very excited to uh, test that integration um, down the road. Okay, so next steps. Another thing that Clyde is working on is um, some custom software to, for example, help maintain the ROV's position above the seafloor and keep that consistent. So as I mentioned, the ROV surveys about um, uh, one meter above the seafloor. And if it's way higher up, you can imagine the size of an urchin gets very small. If you're further down, the size of an urchin gets very large. So it's really important for us to keep the vehicle at a consistent altitude, and that keeps our imagery at a consistent scale. So that surf track, um, it's been developed extensively, and he is in the process of getting it integrated into Arju Sub, which is the software that runs on the ROV, and then anyone will be able to use surf track. And then next steps, um, Clyde is excited about autonomous operations, so we're going to uh, continue on that track with maintaining a consistent forward velocity. Again, that will enable a consistent survey speed and then waypoint navigation as well. So there's there's you know three hundred thousand dollar ROVs out there that have this built in that the company has developed and packaged. And if you you know write the check, they will give it to you. What Clyde is doing is trying to develop similar features, but we're going to have it open source, and so anyone could do this. And that's part of why I want to share this information with you all. Okay. And then lastly, before I take a, a quick pivot and then wind down, um, like I said before, we're not looking to replace divers. I'm a diver, I wanna keep diving. ROVs are, are one of several tools that we can utilize in the Nearshore subtitle that I think are worth exploring further. Um, I have grayed out here autonomous vehicles because that's largely an unknown for what, what that could look like in kelp forests. Although I just met a company last week that has developed a model that's you know, about two and a half feet long and, and barely has anything sticking off of it that could get tangled in kelp. So it's, it's a rapidly changing field. And I think it's really exciting from the perspective that we have technology at our disposal that is becoming very accessible. And I think, I think that integrating that into some of our coastal surveillance programs could be really useful for tackling the challenges that these ecosystems are facing. Okay, with that, I want to do a slight pivot um, and talk about briefly that the ROV has been an amazing tool for outreach and education events. Um, we've done numerous of these. I'm not going to really detail them. Um, highlight is we let the kids drive the ROV often um, if the conditions are appropriate to do so. We just turn the thrusters down so they can't like plunge into the seafloor too quickly. Um, what we find is that they're actually really good at flying it, likely because they have experience with um, video games and we use a Xbox game controller to fly the ROV. Um, so it's been amazing to see them light up uh, when, when they're able to see a, a harbor seal underwater, for example. Um, we're collaborating broadly um, as a nonprofit. We, we have, it is in our mission to, to partner and collaborate broadly and it's been an absolute pleasure to do so. Um, if folks, if you all in Oregon think something like this could be useful, I, I have it on a website. I have a slide about it detailing everything that we're doing, like the hardware, the code, the, the analyses. I am trying to give this away so that other groups can develop similar methodologies if they so choose. Um, and that information is right here. This is a QR code to our GitHub page. So that has... Uh, videos from the ROV and media events and project synopses reports that I've submitted to the Port of Seattle. Um, and that QR code will also, there's a link on that GitHub page to a second repo 
and that repo um, has all the more details. That That's the code for the data analysis. That links to Clyde's work and the, the GitHub repositories that he has, um, that he's developed. So it's all out there. Um, if I think this could be useful if someone down there, or maybe in a perfect world, I'd love to come down and fly the ROV. Um, but when thinking about before and after data for a translocation, I, I think this could potentially be powerful. And very lastly, what I want to touch on is that we've been helping other groups get up and running. So because we've had the information open source and we've communicated it, other groups have expressed interest. So we've gone out with the two LALIP and we've demonstrated proof of concept for, yes, indeed, the downward facing imagery can capture gooey duck siphons. So they've purchased an ROV. They're customizing it um, just like ours. We just bought them a GPS system on a grant. Um, so we're helping them get up and running. And likewise, the Port of Seattle uh, also just purchased an ROV and customized it just like ours. So, you know, anyone can do this. It, it's, it's not terribly complicated. I don't have a robotics background, um, and we're trying to, to enable other groups to do this as much as possible. So with that, um, thank you all very much. I want to acknowledge all our funders and all the folks at the Seattle Aquarium and our broader partners and collaborators. Uh, we really could not have done any of this without the broader team. So thank you all very much. And thank you, uh, Chanel and Bob, for the invitation. I, I really appreciate being able to talk here. So thank you. Thanks, Zach. That was incredible. Thank you also for making everything so accessible for people to utilize and help understand our kelp forests out there. Uh, I know definitely this could be super useful, especially for us in Oregon. Um, so maybe we can get some eager grad students to uh, jump on this opportunity soon. Uh, okay, so if you have any questions for Zach, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom panel. We have a couple questions rolling in. Uh, Beth asks, do you ever use iNaturalist observations to help with your surveys or maybe to find new sites to check out? Is there a way community scientists can help? Yeah, thank you. That's that's a great question. Um, I I haven't used that explicitly to to motivate sites, but I'll have to look into that further. I, I believe members of my team do extensively use iNaturalist, so that's a great thought, and I'll I'll look into that further. Thank you. Awesome. She also said that. Love that you're embracing open source collaboration is where it's at for conservation. That should be like a bumper sticker. <laughs> Agreed. Uh -huh. Okay, let's see. What are the rough costs of a basic ROV? Yeah, great question. Um, so the cost of the vehicle itself is about $4,000. And then the tether is another $1,500. Uh, if you want to get everything, including the GPS. Well, the GPS system is going to be about 7K. Uh, the DVL is about 8K. And so right now we're looking at about 30K. And that's that's a decent amount of money for sure. Um, it is substantially less than the working class ROVs that I showed pictures of. Those deep sea models, those are going to be in the 300 to 400 to 500 on up to multi-millions of dollars. So, you know, you can write a grant, a 30K grant. I mean, those, those are out there for sure. So it, it is reasonably accessible. Awesome. How how long do you think it would take to train someone or like, a you know, some grad students per se uh, to learn how to utilize the ROV? Yeah, not, not long. It takes, it comes in a kit. So we actually assemble it ourselves. You don't have to solder or do anything super detailed like that, but you do, you know, put some screws in place, but that helps you develop familiarity with the system. Um, and it helps you uh, be able to troubleshoot down the road. So it takes about a day and a half to two days to assemble the vehicle. And then you can develop uh, comfort flying it relatively quickly. I mean, we, we've trained multiple people on it. It's not terribly difficult. We fly it with an Xbox video game controller and it's it's very intuitive. Great. Is there anything 
interesting or funky that you found doing one of these surveys in the ocean? Um, we've seen, I mean, we've seen some pretty wild things. We saw, we got some imagery of uh, an octopus on a tire reef. So I don't know if you all know about tire reefs. They were rather unfortunate. And I believe the 70s folks thought it'd be a good idea to lash together a bunch of tires, chuck them overboard to create fish habitat, not realizing that chemicals leach, etc. So that's a bit of a bummer. Uh, we dove the ROV on one of them and captured an octopus that um, exhibited some wild mimicry. We have this video on our website. It basically started uh, imitating an invertebrate as best as we can tell. It, it kind of sucked itself up into a small ball, like a shelled thing, and then started walking on its tentacles as if it had like crab legs. And so it, it was doing that while we were filming it. And then a uh, cancer crab nearby tucked into the tire reef may have thought it was some sort of competitor because then the crab came out and actually charged the octopus and the octopus then broke the mimicry and, and kind of darted away a little bit. Um, but it, that was just a super cool instance uh, that we captured. That is super amazing. Octopus are one of my favorite animals. Don't tell the sea otters that, but right. um, very cool. Okay. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, we have some more questions for you. Cheryl asks, do you plan to expand your ROV fleet to expand survey frequency, et cetera? Yes. Yeah. So we will be doing um, frequency, increasing frequencies uh, for the urban kelp project with the port. We're going to survey some select sites um, approximately once a month to better capture the progression of uh, kelp growth. When does that start? When do they recruit? When do they become visible? And what's their approximate trajectory? Um, and then so that's that's temporally and spatially, yes. Um, we do want to eventually ramp up work on the outer coast and, and establish more um, permanent index stations where we can go with the ROV and try to dig into that uh, sea otter kelp resilience question more thoroughly. Great, thank you. Someone else asks, are there any rules or laws governing who and where this technology can be used? And as it becomes more accessible, are there any concerns? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so I don't think there's really any state, at least Washington state rules that we need to be aware of other than we need to retrieve the vehicle and not create debris essentially by losing it somehow. Um, we do have we do have a permit to do the Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary. So that's that's a NOAA federal permit to operate within the sanctuary. And you need a similar permit in any California sanctuary, for example. Um, and then there may be local regulations. Um, so, for example, you know, we, we work closely with tribal partners up here um, and we would not, you know, distribute data or, or imagery if there were any sort of concerns on their end. But in terms of broad overarching regulations, uh, there, it doesn't seem to be, um, yeah, a, a major issue at this phase. Thank you. Um, Jim asks, do you, uh, uh, let's see, does your video analyst program work well with uh, our 1K diver DPV scooter video transects? Um, it's interesting. I, I don't know. I'd have to see some of the imagery. Um, we're, we're training the algorithms, um, to have a consistent set of imagery and there's going to be another AI talk that, that may get into this a bit, but if, if you tried to incorporate kind of a completely different scale of data from a different, uh, sensor platform, it may work. It may, it may not work. Um, you just have to kind of try it to see. Um, but with those programs being open source, anyone can you know, start training an algorithm by uploading data. You, you don't have to code or, or anything like that. Okay, he said he'll get in contact you, with you soon about that. Great. He's recording Coast Aquarium. Um, okay, great. Uh, Anna asks, could you imagine someone using an ROV for urchin removal to help restore kelp habitat down the road? So a couple of things on that. Um, Macaw Fishery Management, one of their interests with the ROV and what we went out to try to demonstrate proof of concept was of was, can we track the spatial extent of an urchin barren? So the perimeter of an urchin barren, and then can we go back and do that year after year and monitor changes? 
Um, for urchin removal explicitly, there are ROVs in other parts of the world that do just this. Um, lionfish removal, for example, we just learned about an ROV at the conference last week where it, it has a little stabbing thing to remove invasive lionfish. Mm -hmm. Hypothetically, something like that could be possible for sea urchins. Um, one big caveat I'll note is that the scale that a human can affect with hand removal is going to be challenging compared to the scale of the coast, essentially. Um, ROVs could operate at larger scales. Um, I, I, I don't know what that would look like, though. I guess one final point is that there, there's at least one group in California that I'm aware of that is trying to bait sea urchins with traps underwater. And, uh, and then they use an ROV to, to activate a, kind of like uh, an enclosure. It doesn't fully close it, but it, it, it essentially pulls, enables them to pull the line up. So they don't have to have surface lines. They bring the surface line down with the ROV attach it to the trap, and then they haul the trap up to the surface. So that's kind of partially integrating the ROV into that removal process. Great, thank you. Cheryl has a question. In future work to learn more about sea otter and kelp forest resiliency, how would you navigate ROV use and disturbing sea otters as a protected species? Yeah, good question. Um, so I worked for USGS for many years in California before starting the PhD. And what, what we often find out on a vessel is that when we show up, the otters make themselves scarce. So I, I, I think the, the otter is likely going to see us coming and just kind of exit the area um, of their own fruition. Um, and certainly if, if you had a raft of animals that were very habituated, like you get, for example, in, in Cannery Row and Monterey, then you'd want to exercise uh, the same caution and distancing that, that you would in any other context, whether you're a, a paddle boarder or a kayaker, et cetera. Um, they, you know, the ROV is on the seafloor, so it's not likely to bother a, a resting otter. otter. Um, but you know, they, they certainly might see it diving and wonder what it is. I, I kind of, I'd love to catch that on video. I just hope the otter isn't too um, excitable because yeah, we've, we've had them play with things underwater that can just absolutely destroy gear. <laughs> yeah. Um, Colin has a question. Um, what do you think about potentially using off the shelf consumer recreation grade ROVs in the one to 2000 range? I know it would be tough to create high accuracy spatial maps, but uh, have you thought about using these at all? I mean, that that's not too far away from what the blue robotics model is with that, the entry of the blue ROV2 being about 4K. Um, I, I think in capability wise, it's a step up from the, the Trident, I think is another one of the relatively low cost models. Um, those, those lower cost models can work. They can certainly tell you what's going on down there. Um, a big part of our focus with the research, at least, is being able to kind of speak comprehensively to what's going on in terms of um, the spatial fidelity. So being able to attach that spatial tracking system to the ROV is kind of key for us. But if you just want to get a sense of what's going on down there, I think uh, low cost ROVs are a great tool to help calibrate hypotheses or questions about the system that you may not know otherwise or may not have the opportunity to get in the water yourself. Wonderful. Well, that concludes all the questions that our attendees have. Um, so if you have any final words, comments, please share them. Um, but we're super grateful to have you today on the symposium. Thanks so much, Zach. Thank you, Chanel and Bob and everyone. Um, thank you for the opportunity. Wonderful. Thanks, everyone.